The first thing I want to do before we turn to our colloquy is to recognize and to thank the most extraordinary staff that I have ever had the pleasure of working with, my colleagues in the back of the room. Uh, can, I, can I call you by name? <laughs> we, uh, we have Ryan Sabat, and we have Dominique, and we have Alexis and Eric, and Danny hiding behind him, and Christina and Nick. Many of you have been in touch with our, our, our staff uh, in getting this conference together, and Ted and Laurie and Jackie and Armand. Thank you all for the extraordinary efforts that you've put into making this day possible. <laughs> Say nothing of the other 364 days, and Acta never sleeps. We're, we're always on the job. Well, th oh, welcome back. There's a natural segue from our previous topic, educating for citizenship, to that oxygen that without which we do not have citizenship in a free society. Gallup recently released a survey, uh, actually just, just this past spring, of the attitudes of college students and began its summary with a reassuring headline, college students oppose restrictions on political speech. But Gallup's numbers were not reassuring. In fact, 27% said, in essence, that political discourse must give way to sensitivity. I remain very puzzled that Gallup didn't consider this a really alarming result. If, for example, 27% of college students advocated raising the drinking age to 35, I can't help thinking that we would have seen a different headline in Gallup's report. And to go on, 49% uh, of that group of college students surveyed said that it really is okay to bar reporters if the campus protesters think that the reporters might be unsympathetic to the protesters' viewpoints. And I, I believe most of us, and I, I think it's true, praise the Lord, for the whole of the nation, most of us recognize that there's a growing crisis on campus that threatens intellectual progress and leaves graduates ill-equipped for a free society and perhaps even hostile to the freedoms that have been the lifeblood of American life. Um, it's with some trepidation with um, Ava Braun and um, Bill McClay, both from St. John's here, that I am um, going to quote Herodotus. But 2,500 years ago, Herodotus imagined a Greek saying to a Persian, if you knew what freedom is, you wouldn't just fight for it with a spear, you'd pick up a hatchet and fight for it. Well, it's sad to us to think how many college students would be just as happy to have their administrators take away their freedom. The participants in this colloquy are people who are resisting this dangerous slide into a stifled silence. And we're going to go in this order. Jonathan Haidt, social psychologist and professor of ethical leadership at New York University Stern School of Business, has started the Heterodox Academy to build a wide consensus among scholars that the Academy will falter and fail without diversity of viewpoint. He will be followed by Ruth Weiss, professor of Yiddish and contemporary literature emerita of Harvard University, who's going to give us an unblinking look into how the campaign against the faculty monoculture must be waged. And then Gail Harriet, professor of law at University of San Diego, member of the US Civil Rights Commission, is going to address the structural issues, the offices of equity, the, of the offices of diversity that have fostered the repression of free expression on campus. And finally, Solveig Gold, Princeton senior and co-founder of the Princeton Open Campus Coalition, whose success in resisting Princeton's march to, dare I say, enforced groupthink, offers us not just hope, but a vision for what other campuses can accomplish. So with that, let me welcome Jonathan Haidt.
Okay. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you all for, uh, for being here and for working together with us all on this problem. Uh, as one of the questioners at the end said, well, what are we going to do? Uh, you know, it's all fine to talk, but I want solutions. I think uh, from what I heard in the, in the last session and from what I think we have on this panel, I think our diagnosis of what's going on is sharpening. I think we have a lot of insight into what's happening, and I think in this session we will turn to s some solutions. I'll show you a couple that, that we've come up with at Heterodox Academy. So I want to open with two quotations written in the mid-19th century from two men writing in London, uh, two different visions of intellectual life and, by extension, visions of what a university should be. So first, uh, John Stuart Mill, his famous, uh, his famous uh, line from On Liberty, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. And of course, Mill and On Liberty was just brilliant at understanding the limitations of human reasoning, how biased and flawed and often shallow and silly we are, but when we push against each other, we challenge each other and we get better, we get smarter together. On this view of human nature, on this view of intellectual life, a university must have viewpoint diversity and it dies, it dies if it has political orthodoxy and a monoculture. Now here's a very different view. <clears throat> Uh, so this is an internet meme. The point is not merely to understand the world. The point is to change it. The actual quote is pretty much, I mean, the, the real quote is basically that in spirit. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Now, that can be very inspiring to an undergraduate, but is that really the point of intellectual life? Is that what professors should be focused on? Uh, this kind of viewpoint leads to the idea that the university is there to challenge privilege and power and um, um, viewpoint diversity, political diversity, would just get in the way. When I showed up at Yale in 1981, here's what it said over the doorway. It said, lux et veritas. So truth as the telos, the purpose, the goal of the university was very clear and explicit. But over, uh, over the time that I've been in the academic world, the telos at many schools has been gradually changing to more the, the, the Marxist one of change. The point of this place is to change the world, and not just change in general, but social justice in particular. Um, now, um, I'm gonna argue, uh, and I've been arguing publicly in the last month or two, that what we need is a schism. We must separate the universities into those that are pursuing uh, social justice, and Brown has volunteered to take the leadership position on that, um, <laughs> and those that are going to devote themselves to pursuing truth as their telos, and Chicago has, has volunteered to take the leadership position on that. Um, so this is, these slides are taken, I just gave a talk at Duke a few weeks ago, it just came, went up online, it's, my, it's like an hour-long talk, but it lays out exactly what I think has gone wrong and what we need to do. But here's the, the key idea, the reason why we need this schism is this one piece of psychology. Um, so motivated reasoning, I'm a social psychologist, I study more, uh, morality, moral judgment, moral reasoning. The basic rule is this, we don't look out at the world and say, where's the weight of the evidence? We start with an initial supposition and we say, can I believe it? If I wanna believe something, I ask, can I believe it? Can I find a justification? But if I don't wanna believe it, I start by saying, must I believe it? Am I forced to believe it or can I escape? So just to give you one example, in a classic study, students come into the lab, uh, they're taking psychology classes, they're learning about experimental methods, so they're given a study, it looks like it's from the journal Science, and they're asked to critique the methods. And the study seems to show that caffeine consumption is associated with breast cancer. And your job now is to read the study and say, what do you think of the methods? Well, who do you think finds a lot of flaws in that study? Who do you think? Coffee drinkers, do you think all coffee drinkers are trying to find flaws in the study? Women who drink coffee are desperately saying, must I believe it, must I believe it, what could possibly be wrong? And they find all kinds of things wrong with it. The others say, oh gosh, okay, I didn't know that. Um, so this is called motivated reasoning. And there's great research from Dan Kahan at Yale that scholars and experts are just as subject to this problem and sometimes more so. The more you know about a field, the easier you can find post hoc justifications for whatever you want to believe. So motivated scholarship is the rule throughout the academy. Uh, if, what, if a scholar undertakes research in order to support a political agenda, she or he is almost guaranteed to succeed um, and to believe that she or he is not biased. Motivated scholarship puts things out there. A weak study with a small sample size will get propagated across the academy, across the world. Very difficult to recall if it's disproven because if people want to believe it, they will. 
Now, there's one major protection we have against this. It's called institutionalized disconfirmation. This is the reason why science is so great. This was the discovery that Europeans made in their coffee shops and communities of gentlemen scholars reading each other's papers and publishing letters. The community of science is a community devoted to institutionalized disconfirmation. We're all motivated, but if I'm motivated to disprove you and you're motivated to disprove me, we get the John Stuart Mill phenomenon and the truth emerges but that doesn't happen anymore in politicized areas. This is data that should scare the hell out of you. This is data that you might not know. I didn't know it until two years ago. What this is, this is data from uh, Higher Education Research Institute. This is nationally representative data of uh, professors at American universities. As late as the mid-1990s, the left to right ratio was only two to one. The blue line is people who self-identify as being on the far left or left, and the red line is, is uh, right or far right and the purple line in the middle is moderates. So, and this is all department. This includes the agriculture school, the dental school, everything. So two to one, left to right. Um, but just 15 years later, it had changed to five to one. Five to one. And again, this includes all the professional schools. If you focus on the core areas of the humanities and social sciences, which is where most of the concern is on our panel and the previous panel, what do you find? Well, I can show you the data from my field, psychology, and it's the same story in the others. Uh, so I published a paper with some colleagues uh, two years ago on how the uh, homogeneity damages our research. We put together all the research we could find. What you see is that in 1960, there was a study that looked at who professors of psychology voted for, and four to one, they went for Kennedy. Now, then they were asked to recall, who did you vote for previously? And as you see, roughly two to one, they went for the Democrat. Right? So psychologists have always leaned left politically. As late as 1996, so the diamonds are party, who you voted for. The circles are left, right, or liberal conservative. So as late as 1996, psychologists were only four to one, left to right, professors of psychology. But again, between the mid-90s and 2010, everything changes. And the numbers go up and up and up. And just last week or two weeks ago, we got a new data point from Langbert et al, 17 to one. 17 to one. And I know the one guy. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> Okay, so this is happening in, throughout the humanities and social sciences, and even to some extent in the sciences now. This has many, many profound and threatening implications for students and for faculty. For students, what this means is that orthodox views become strongly held, but weakly supported. They actually can't even justify the beliefs they hold so passionately because they've never been challenged. And what that means is that if anybody comes close to challenging, it's very threatening. A phrase they use is, you are invalidating my existence. If you challenge a proposition that I hold dear, you are invalidating my existence. So students are afraid to do so, and I, I hear all over the place, students say it's kind of boring in seminar classes, no one will disagree. And many students become intellectually fragile from the lack of challenge, and that's why when a, when a controversial speaker comes to campus, they don't just not go, they don't argue back, they have to come together to get the, student, the speaker banned, or they do a protest to drown him or her out. For faculty, of course, this has many implications, misallocation of effort, loss of rigor in our thinking, fear of dissent, and recently, just the last two or three years, fear of our students. One of the reasons that the comment was made that faculty lack courage, that's absolutely true, now we're actually quite afraid of our students because it's so easy for them. We're really busy, and at the drop of a hat, if, any, if we offend anyone in the class, it could be months of hearings. They can go right to the Equal Opportunity Commission. It's a nightmare, and so we're all afraid of our students. This is why I founded, uh, with my colleagues who wrote that paper, um, Heterodox Academy. I urge you all to go to hetero heterodoxacademy.org. It's the opposite of Orthodox Academy. <laughs> Um, and if you are a professor, if you are, whether you're tenured or untenured, if you, have a, uh, um, uh, if you are a tenured or tenure track professor, please join. Um, we have 220 professors now uh, from all fields um, who have come together to say, we actually think that there should be some viewpoint diversity. We think that's important. I just want to share with you our most important project, and this is why I came down here from New York, because we need the help of the trustees and alumni. Here's what we did. Um, th we just put this out last week. We took the top 150 schools from the US News rankings, 
And um, you know, great, you wanna know, you know, you want, you want a school that has a small faculty to student ratio? Well, you know, US News will factor that in. But what if you actually want to be exposed to viewpoint diversity? What if you want your child to not just be in an indoctrination mill? How can you find out where to go? You can't. Until two weeks ago, you can go to the Heterodox Academy Guide to Colleges, and we've quantified, did they endorse, has the school passed a resolution endorsing Chicago? What does FIRE say about them? What does ISI say about them? And what's been happening in the news that gives us an indication? And here's the rankings. Uh, we put it on a zero to 100 scale, and Chicago uh, tops the list. Um, so Chicago, Purdue, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Princeton is by far the best Ivy. It's the only Ivy that has any claim to promote viewpoint diversity. So these are what appear to be the good schools. Uh, now this is our first pass. We're gonna bring in a lot more data. Uh, we're, gonna, we're coding now whether the school has a BRT, a bias response team, an Orwellian way that you can, if you hear a joke someplace, there's, there's a website you go to, you report them, and then they get visited by an administrator. So that's coming, that's at a lot of schools. So if they have that, we're gonna really p penalize them. Um, what, about the, uh, uh, what about the bottom? So you can sort by any column if you sort uh, by ranking. Now the worst schools in the country uh, on our first pass are Missouri and uh, Oregon, uh, followed by Brown, and, so, and those are all in a tie. Brown, Georgetown, Harvard, NYU, a bunch of others are down there, six points out of 100. So we hope our goal is to make this a major leverage point for alumni and trustees, because what I'm finding is that the big donors have not stopped giving. They call up the president, they say, hey, what's going on? I really care about freedom of speech. And the president reassures them, don't worry, we've got it under control, we're doing this and that. Oh, okay. That's right, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they are under control, that's right. So uh, I'm really hoping, I've been working with, with ACTA, to, to try to give donors a clear stop and go signal. Make your, make your gifts conditional on them making progress on this metric. Um, so to conclude, there are two very different views of what a university should be um, based on these two ideas. I think uh, the only viable form for university that will be a benefit to the public, that will actually uh, bring us forward in finding truth is one based on John Stuart Mill's principles. And then I'll just end, I'll just put this up here. This is at Heterodox Academy, we have a business plan. This is our stakeholder analysis. This is how, what we see happening. Um, I'm in a business school now, so I'm learning how to do stakeholder analyses. I thought, let me try it here, it works pretty well. So if you think about the president and the administration in the center, there are a lot of stakeholders. There are a lot of people who care about what the university does. And what you see here is in green are the people who generally care about free speech and free inquiry. So the, the people in the community, most Americans, as one person said before, most Americans are, they're, they're, don't like what's going on on the universities. The alumni, uh, prospective students generally. So most people uh, out there outside the university are our allies. The yellow region are the people on campus, and that's where the problem is. On campus, you have staff, and you have many staff that are devoted to diversity and inclusion, worthy goals, but if you say all that matters is diversity and inclusion, therefore we don't want any ideas that could upset people. So in red are the people who I think are opposed to uh, freedom of, of inquiry and freedom of expression on campus. Um, uh, and so you see that in the faculty, the humanities are generally on the other side, as we saw at Yale, uh, 400 uh, humanities faculty rushed to support the protesters and condemn the Christakis's. Uh, the science faculty are overwhelmingly on our side on this. Um, it took a month, but uh, 40 professors a month later um, put their names up saying that they supported the Christakis's, 40, and they were almost all in the natural sciences or they were in the Christakis's home departments. And guess what? The Yale students come back saying, those scientists, they need retraining. They need re-education. They're insensitive. So again, faculty are afraid to stand up. The red line is what we call the... Um, um, the, what do we call it, the axis of uh, something or other. Oh, I had a catchy name for it. But the point is that uh, the federal government, the Department of Education, Department of Justice are really putting the screws on universities to, uh, to crack down on any case where someone feels marginalized and that leads them to these excessive procedures. Um, the axis of outrage, I'm sorry, that's it. So there's an axis of outrage in which ideas propagated in the studies departments of the humanities spread to the, the social justice warrior students, um, supported by the diversity and therapy staff uh, with pressure from the DOE and DOJ. So that's the situation, and that's why we think the solution, well, there's many, you have to do many things, but basically we have to empower or strengthen the people in green and break up the axis of outrage. And if alumni, alumni are the most powerful force here, if the alumni will give to schools that are doing a good job of it and tell the president directly, I am no longer giving. Until you work on this problem, I will not give any more money. 
When that happens, I think we'll start to see change. Thank you. Uh, the glory of having um, acquired the um, distinction of being a conservative, and if I had not been a conservative going in, believe me, I would have become one <laughs> just to spite. Um, I have to tell you that my greatest uh, thing is, the, I don't know whether you know, but at Harvard, for example, there can be any kind of student club, but you have to have advisors for a student club. I'm an advisor, or was an advisor, for the best clubs on campus, the Republican Club, uh, the Salient, which was the uh, conservative student newspaper, but my proudest moment was when a group was forming on the right wing of the Catholic Church, and they asked me to be their advisor. <laughs> so I only say this to prove your point about there being nobody else on campus. <laughs> because Mary Ann Glendon of the law school was then um, in the Vatican. She was an ambassador to the Vatican, and that's how hard up <laughs> the students were. Uh, need I say, uh, maybe I, it's not obvious, I, I'm Jewish. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, I assume that there's very little information that I can bring you about the current state of the campus, so I thought what I would do is to lay out one aspect of the problem of repression based on my own experience. I was hired by Harvard in 1992 for a newly established position in Yiddish literature and comparative literature, and really, I am wholeheartedly grateful for the chance that this gave me to teach and to help to train students, teachers, to become professors in this important field. Um, many people think that Yiddish is some kind of comedy routine or a nostalgic link with the immigrant parent or grandparent generation. And I've seen it cited, actually, as one of those irrelevant courses, like the zombie <laughs> courses, that are squeezing out a serious study in the humanities. So if you bring me here for another occasion, I would really make the case for the centrality of my subject to the study of Western civilization. But since that's not my mandate, I will just describe what happened when I began my tenure. So during our interviews about the appointment, the dean asked me whether I would be prepared to teach a course in what was then called the core which required all students to take at least one course in seven designated areas in the humanities, social sciences, and sciences. And there were many courses, or they tried to get as many courses as they could within each of these categories. But these were large courses filled with students who in many cases were just filling the requirements. And some teachers had no inclination to do this. But I jumped at the chance to promote the interest in Yiddish and Jewish literature, and I designed my own version of a great books course. I chose eight works of lasting value that span seven centuries of the 20th, uh, seven decades of the 20th century, one book from each decade, thus covering many historical issues, like the breakdown of tradition and the advent of modernity, deracination, the rise of nationalism, the world wars, the Russian Revolution, mass immigration, and so forth. Jews kind of play a, a kind of central point in many of these things, so it was not hard to find brilliant texts about these. So to convey the idea, the concept of Jewish literature and the intricacies of Jewish history, I selected works in Yiddish and Hebrew and in non-Jewish languages at least six or seven languages in all, including German, Russian, Italian, English, sometimes Dutch, French, or Polish. I taught Sholem Aleichem, Kafka, Isaac Babel, Isaac Basheva Singer, Shai Agnon, Primo Levi, Saul Bellow, three of these are Nobel Prize winners. Books so good that I was eager to reread them and teach them every two years. One of my teachers in college had taught a course called Great Writings in European Literature. And um, he taught it as if he felt that this was the only reliable education that we were likely to get. Now, minus such megalomaniacal intentions, 
I did put this course together with the same sense of urgency. Mostly, I wanted students to delight in reading and to begin digging into compelling books. After the first class, a student came up to see me. She said, why are there no women writers on this course? Now, at some point, this might have been a genuine question. If, let's say, a month and a half into the course, when we were reading, let's say, Bobble's war-torn uh, classic Red Cavalry, um, if someone then had longed for another kind of fiction, might have asked, couldn't we be dealing with some lighter domestic issues? Isn't there something like Willa Cather or Barbara Pym? I might then have devoted a whole class to why the greatest British novels of the 19th century are by women writing about local issues, and why Jewish women of the early 20th century are not producing classics of that kind. But this student had not asked out of curiosity. She had come to the class in order to pose a political ideological challenge. And in another course, a colleague teaching American history had been charged, formally charged, uh, with a complaint by two students wanting to know why are there no black writers. These questions are meant to undermine the integrity of the intended course, as in, how dare you omit what we deem obligatory. We subordinate your subject to our political demand, and we will make our demand until you bow to it. So higher education, I think, began to collapse at the point that the first teacher gave in to this assault. And although, as I say, this was happening on many fronts, I will focus here on the pressure from the women's movement. We've all witnessed, and many of us have experienced, huge changes in the expectations of women, the rights and opportunities extended to women, and in the study of women. I believe that above and beyond the important rights that women have won for themselves, science and technology have brought to the lives of women improvements in procreation, in uh, child delivery, in infant mortality, that constitute one of the most dramatic changes in the history of humankind. What ought to have inspired a movement of gratitude and a time for thoughtful review was hijacked as a movement of grievance and a bid for the transference of power. The women's movement of the 60s became the sturdiest faction of the new left, Despite the fact that it is less violent and therefore apparently less threatening than other political fronts, I suggest that it is often the most pernicious force on campus and hence perhaps in the political life of the country. Returning to that young woman who asked not what, course, uh, what a course had to teach, but why it lacked female authors, and by the way, I cite this uh, woman just as a prototype, the first problem that she poses to the university is that she cannot be educated. She wants courses to conform to her convictions and for the university to impose those convictions on the curriculum. Whereas literature invites us to experience the lives of others and the humanities want us to know the best of what is thought and said and we have heard wonderful things here today about what the role of the humanities and social sciences and a true education, or what, what the, that role should be. Um, she doesn't trust the course for precisely those reasons. She is not looking for instruction, but to instruct. Now, we may pity the partisan student as the first casualty of her dogma, but she does not intend to be a casualty, rather to claim neglect as a means of imposing her dogma on others. If she had joined the class, she would have diverted as much attention as she could to her cause. Why does Kafka have K visit a prostitute? prostitute? Why does Babel present, represent women so grossly? She would have had a field day with Isaac Bashevis Singer and Saul Bellow, whom the feminist movement anyway accuses of misogyny. 
She undermines the authenticity of important works by the coarseness of her alleged championship of women and damages the true interests of her gender that lie, I believe, with the understanding of humankind that the humanities once sought to encourage. But her movement gains traction. The principle of affirmative action that was conceived as a means of correcting for past injustice to African slaves has been appropriated by women in admissions and hiring. The principle of group preferences, I never allow the words affirmative action to be used at a faculty meeting without getting up and saying it's not affirmative action, it is group preferences. I'm not the most beloved person <laughs> in my faculty. Um, so the principle of group preferences has long since replaced the ideal of objective judgment irrespective of race, creed, color, or gender. And from merely favoring women in hiring, the stakes were soon raised. Because women are half the population, they should be half the faculty. The pressure for this comes from above in the form of government questionnaires administered by people whose job it is to apply numerical standards and from students and, um, and teachers who say that women role models are needed. I mean, this to me is also a fantastic concept. I mean, I, I don't understand it in teaching, to be honest. I never had a, a, a female role model as opposed to a male role model. It never occurred to me that a male teacher would not be a perfect role model. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I find this, uh, you know, some, maybe I have the wrong kind of brain, but it, it just, it, it, it's, it's just a, a foolishness. It doesn't belong, that question doesn't belong in that realm of, uh, of uh, experience, of human experience. And, um, and so some of us who thought that a community of scholars is what we would find, we find instead, I found instead, a women's clutch subsidized by the university to consolidate women's grievances. So the article that was circulated, uh, my article, Dear Helen or Sexual Correctness at Harvard, describes the role of a women's cabal in ousting President Lawrence Summers from Harvard and there's much more to say about the way the women's club is used to intimidate and to assault. Uh, there are even more serious abuses than these I've cited, such as the hounding of men for rape, which trivial trivializes real assault and infantilizes women, and the ascription of blame to alcohol and fraternities without any attempt to counsel women on the dangers of using sex as a sport. Dogma drives out the search for truth by constituting itself as truth. So I wanted to highlight this feature of this campus culture of pusillanimity because I've seen it strike deeper than the other instruments of repression. As for how it can be countered, I think it requires resistance from every male and female professor. I'm often reminded of the scene at Judgment at Nuremberg not a great movie, but one can learn from anything. The American judge, played by Spencer Tracy, visits the convicted Nazi judge, Ernst Janning, played by Burt Lancaster, who says, trying to justify himself, those millions of people, I never knew it would come to that. You must believe it. To which Tracy replies, Herr Janning, it came to that the first time you sentenced a man to death, whom you knew to be innocent. So that's how I feel about the academy. We sentenced it to irrelevance the first time we gave in to political blackmail. And one slips into the habit so easily that one hardly realizes that it is happening. Thank you. Today's colleges and universities are no longer the rough and tumble marketplace of ideas um, of a generation or two ago. Increasingly, they're about rigid orthodoxy. Some examples, uh, in the past two or three years, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, Wall Street Journal editor Jason Riley, and nationally syndicated columnist George Will, uh, and many more, have been disinvited to speak on college campuses. Outside campus, these are mainstream dignitaries. On campus, they're considered beyond the pale. 
Libertarian feminist Wendy McElroy was permitted to participate in a debate at Brown University in which she was expected to criticize the use of the over-the-top term rape culture. But Brown set aside for students uh, a room for students who may be traumatized by allowing Ms. McElroy to speak on campus. The room was equipped with Play-Doh, calming music, pillows, blankets, and a video of frolicking puppies. <laughs> at Emory and at DePaul University, chalking on the sidewalk was never considered to be much of a problem until somebody chalked Donald Trump's name, um, and then there was an uproar. Uh, no issue is too small to be noticed by the enforcers of orthodoxy. In today's university, if a student wears a kimono in a Halloween um, pageant, at best she can expect to be accused of cultural appropriation. Um, let me point out parenthetically that we'd all be walking around in bearskins today if it weren't for cultural uh, appropriation. Imitation is not just the sincerest form of flattery. Uh, it is the way that 99% of all improvement in human lives occurs. Um, but cultural appropriation is actually the best uh, that our kimono wearing student can expect. Um, more likely she will be told that her choice of Halloween costume shows that she is a racist or a sexist. Um, my question here is where is all this coming from? Um, you know, this isn't just students who make mistakes because they're young. It's universities themselves uh, that are promoting, stifling political correctness. Um, so rather than training their students um, in a sense of detachment, something that's necessary in order to be able to grapple with difficult issues uh, and an attempt to understand what other people are thinking and what they are trying to, to, to argue for, instead of promoting that sense of detach detachedness. Um, students are being encouraged to take offense on behalf of their group um, for even the most innocent of behaviors. Rather than treat the symptoms, I urge you to look for some of the underlying causes and supports uh, for the current situation. Again, where is all this coming from? There are lots of answers to that question. Um, I have time to mention only a few, uh, and my expertise happens to lie in the area of race and sex law, uh, and so that's what I will concentrate on. Um, but that is where I think a very large uh, bulk of the problem happens to lie. Uh, if we want to make the problem go away, we're going to have to grapple uh, with these, these issues. First one I want to mention, racial preferences in admissions is a significant contributing factor uh, to stultifying political correctness. Consider this, one consequence of widespread race preferences and admissions is that underrepresented minority students end up distributed among universities in very different patterns from their white or Asian counterparts. When the schools that are highest on the academic ladder relax their admission standards to admit more minority students, schools one rung down must do likewise uh, if they're to have minority students. The problem is thus passed to the schools another rung down, which do the same. As a result, underrepresented minority students are concentrated at the bottom of most selective schools. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, there are always exceptions to that rule, um, but it is true of just about every selective law, every selective university now. And the problem is not that there are no academically gifted minority students but there are not currently enough at the very top tiers to satisfy the demand, and that efforts to change that have created a strange and unhealthy credentials gap uh, up and down the pecking order. For example, we learned in connection with the Gruder and the Graz cases, uh, the cases against the University of Michigan uh, before the Supreme Court 13 years ago, uh, that gave Michigan underrepresented uh, minority students a preference, a preference that amounted to an entire letter grade, all of the things being equal. So African-American and Hispanic students with a 3.0 average 
uh, were treated as if they had a 4.0 average for the purposes of admission. This is no tiebreaker in otherwise close cases. Uh, the preferences are very large, and since 2003, when that case was decided, they've been getting larger. Alas, entering credentials matter. Students whose academic credentials are well below the average for a particular school usually earn grades to match. And while some students outperform their academic credentials, just as some students will underperform theirs, most students perform in the range that their academic credentials suggest, and no serious supporter of affirmative action denies this. The inevitable result is a campus culture where many minority students feel out of place. They feel like they have more in common with members of their own race at the school than they do with other students. Um, it's easy to get prickly under those circumstances. It's easy to start thinking, hey, it's all politics. Um, or my teacher is a racist, um, and start demanding special safe spaces, start wanting separate dormitories, separate graduation ceremonies. Universities are on pins and needles over race issues uh, because for almost half a century now, they've been designing their admissions process in a way that inevitably leads to that problem. Another related contributing factor um, to this campus culture is the diversity bureaucracy, and obviously these things are related. But these days, every university um, ha has all of them. Um, a diversity dean, uh, an associate de dean in charge of, 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 of uh, outreach and inclusion, um, an assistant dean in charge of LBGT issues, um, a director of special student housing for African Americans, a director of women's studies in the area of science and engineering. Um, there's lots and lots of this. We're not talking about a couple of million dollars uh, dropped by each large university, but we're talking about tens of millions of dollars uh, spent on, on issues of this sort. Um, and in some respects, universities are victims of their own wealth. Um, they can afford salaries for all these diversity bureaucrats, so they have them. Uh, but you can bet that if it's your job to find uh, and to worry about race and sex discrimination, uh, then one way or another, you're going to find that discrimination, even if you have to define sexism and racism uh, down, sometimes way, way down. Um, only the hopelessly naive would expect that none of this would affect campus culture. Of course it does. Now, some of these administrators are actually required by law. The Department of Education has decreed that every school must have Title IX coordinators. And speaking of the Department of Education, let me point out that not all these administrators are actually on the payroll of the individual colleges and universities. Some of it's external. If you're wondering, why is it that the talk of you know, with all the talk of diversity, uh, that somehow the institutions themselves are so non-diverse. Every university is the same as every other university. So little diversity among institutions. Um, why do they all walk, walk in, in, in lockstep on so many issues? Well, for some, it's because they want to keep their accreditation. Uh, accrediting agencies, for example, often require race preferential admissions policies, and some universities or in some law schools have actually had their accreditation threatened because they were thought not to be engaging in enough in the way of racial preferences uh, and admissions. Uh, so it's as simple as that. Dissenters will be threatened with deaccreditation. The Department of Education, of course, has its own internal bureaucracy on top of the accreditors who at least um, in theory are not uh, part of uh, part of the Department of Education, and to justify their existence, they've got to constantly re redefine what race and what sex discrimination means. The latest requirement, of course, out of the Department of Education is the requirement that transgendered students, that is an anatomical male uh, who nevertheless psychologically identifies um, with females, uh, and vice versa, you know, students have to be given the opportunity uh, to use the bathrooms, locker rooms, um, and, and, um, and showers 
um, of the group that they identify with rather than the group where their anatomy actually match matches. And of course, this extends also to sports teams um, and, to, um, and to dormitories. Um, it's not just the work of bureaucrats either. Congress and the courts um, have been a third very large contributing factor to the present situation. This one's really complicated, and I think that, 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 that Michael's going to get too upset with me if I stay up here and try to explain that, because I'd have to go back into like, the history of English courts and how courts of equity and courts of common law had very different traditions. And it's hard to believe, but that really has had a profound effect um, on this issue. Um, We've gotten to the point since the Civil Rights Act of 1991, which was passed during the administration of George H.W. Bush, um, to where the law creates pressures on schools to adopt zero tolerance rules um, that cause them to want to control what happens and what is said um, on campus in order to avoid lawsuits. Um, and you know that's. That's a problem that's not going to be easy to fix. Um, weirdly, um, well, I won't even go into that. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you knock me off the stage here, because uh, it would take me too long to explain it. Uh, it's going to be hard to fix some of these things. Uh, but we can't fool ourselves into believing that we're going to be able to fix it just by applying pressure um, to college administrators now. Uh, we've got some really serious problems that have to be fixed, and a lot of them are tightly wound up with the law. Um, and so we got to start thinking about not just how we're going to put pressure on colleges and universities, but how we're going to put pressure uh, on the levers of government. Princeton students like to say that we live in an orange bubble a thriving community largely unaffected by the socio-political dramas beyond our Gothic walls. When headlines last fall were filled with stories of protests and safe spaces at other colleges, I remember thinking how lucky I was to go to Princeton, where controversial professors like Robbie George, Peter Singer, and Cornell West are welcomed and cherished, and moreover, where they teach students by example how to engage in honest, spirited, and crucially, friendly debate. Indeed, I was quite smug as I watched my peers at Yale mob Pref Professor Nicholas Christakis. That would happen at Yale, I thought to myself. The following weekend was the annual Princeton Yale Glee Club football concert, and our conductor told us to be kind to the Yaleys, who were feeling sensitive after a week of intense media scrutiny and anger on campus. What is always a jovial collegiate event, complete with Yale sucks signs, an anti-Yale skit, and orange paper planes cast to the stage during Yale's performance, was softened with signs attacking Harvard, our common enemy, instead. We even served Yale tea and cookies before the concert. It's worth noting that the Yale Glee Club repaid our generosity by stealing our stuffed tiger mascot. Typical. But in a few short weeks, the orange bubble burst. On November 18th, a group of students calling themselves the Black Justice League invaded historic Nassau Hall and occupied President Eisgruber's office overnight, refusing to leave until Eisgruber had agreed to and signed off on their list of demands. Those demands were the institution of mandatory cultural competency training for students and faculty, a new academic requirement in the study of non-Western and marginalized peoples, affinity housing for black students, a safe space for black students in the school's cultural center, and perhaps most famously, the purging of Woodrow Wilson's name from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and from Wilson College, as well as the removal of a mural depicting Woodrow Wilson in the Wilson College dining hall. President Eisgruber, to his everlasting credit, did not waver in his commitment to academic freedom, diversity of thought, or the democratic process, even as the Black Justice League perched on his desk and shouted at his face. In the late afternoon on the second day of the protest, he presented and signed a carefully worded document that promised in vague terms to set up committees to discuss the students' demands. I suppose it helps to have a professor of constitutional law as your university president. <laughs> But while the events inside Nassau Hall were disturbing, perhaps even more disturbing was what was going on outside Nassau Hall. In the days during and after the protest, the Black Justice League and their supporters cultivated an atmosphere on campus in which other students would not, could not disagree with them. 
Accusations of racism followed those who anonymously voiced their dissent on the social media platform Yik Yak, and black students who spoke out against the protest were instantly labeled white sympathizers, or not really black. As a conservative, I am used to being a lone voice of dissent in the classroom and at the lunch table, but for the first time, many of my liberal friends came up to me, whispering their dismay that they could not safely voice their opinions about the protest without being shouted down as a racist. It was clear that there was widespread disagreement across campus and across the political spectrum with both the methods and demands of the protesters. However, unless students came together to dissent publicly, both the administration and the outside world would see a student body seemingly united behind the Black Justice League. And so 10 of us, previously strangers, established the Princeton Open Campus Coalition, quote, protecting diversity of thought and the right of all students to advance their academic and personal convictions in a manner free from intimidation. Black, white, Hispanic, conservative, liberal, male, female, gay, straight, able, disabled, Jewish, Christian, atheist, POCC may be the most diverse group at Princeton. And though we disagree about almost everything, we agree on one crucial point. Our right to disagree openly must be protected. We wrote an open letter to President Eisgruber outlining the ways in which the Black Justice League's methods and demands had and would continue to compromise academic freedom at Princeton. The letter reached tens of thousands as various media outlets from the National Review to the New York Times picked up our story. Support flooded in from Princeton alumni as well as from professors and students around the country. A liberal student at Wesleyan wrote us a particularly powerful letter that confirmed our fears about cultural competency training. She said, quote, I speak only after glancing over both shoulders, in hushed tones, and with as many qualifiers as I can think of. I feel like I'm living in a version of 1984, truly. I had to undergo social justice sensitivity training. We were told these would be honest, vulnerable conversations for us to dig deep and understand our biases. The truth was that each of us recited lines. This was not open dialogue. We all know the script." End quote. Education should never be scripted. At 21, I don't purport to know all the answers. I don't even know all the questions. I want to hear reasoned arguments on every side of debate, uh, read the textual tradition that has shaped those arguments, form and voice opinions, have those opinions challenged by my professors and fellow students, and only then make up my mind. This is the basic praxis of intellectual inquiry, and this is what's at stake when we talk about academic freedom. The right to free speech in academia is not some abstract right that can only be defended because it is God-given or in our constitution. Rather, it is a right that protects a concrete intellectual good, the accumulation of knowledge in pursuit of the truth. For the most part, my friends and professors at Princeton have recognized the importance of academic freedom and the importance of the work that the Princeton Open Campus Coalition has set out to do. President Eisgruber and several other top administrators willingly met with us at various points last year to engage in productive dialogue about Princeton's continued commitment to academic freedom. While there are certainly radical students and presumably professors who believe that the right not to be offended always trumps the right to free speech, the biggest problem at Princeton is not, I don't think, convincing the general populace that free speech is important. Rather, it is convincing the general populace to stand up for free speech when it comes under the gun. Our meetings with administrators have felt like covert underground operations. Professors have pulled me aside and literally whispered their support for my efforts. When I invited some of my very best friends to like POCC's Facebook page, they responded, of course I support what you're doing, but I can't support it publicly. Indeed, academic free speech is not something students or professors are willing to speak freely about. Why is that? First, of course, is fear. Fear of being fired, fear of getting a bad grade, fear of unpopularity, fear of being called racist. Second, academic freedom is now perceived as a decidedly conservative issue. No matter how many times we remind people that POCC has almost as many liberal members as conservative, we are accused again and again of championing a conservative agenda at the expense of minority rights and feelings. This could not be further from the truth. When we stand up for academic freedom, we are standing up for the academic freedom of all students, including the ones who invaded President Eisgruber's office. But we are associated with conservatism, I think, because it is largely conservative students who are willing to speak out. Conservatives in academia are used to being in the minority, and we're not afraid of unpopularity. Liberals, on the other hand, have, for the most part, never had to face a room full of angry people calling them bigots. 
Liberal students don't want to be called bigoted, and worse, they certainly don't want to be called conservative. If we are to unite students and faculty nationwide behind the cause of academic freedom, we must find a way to depoliticize the issue. And I'd love to hear your ideas about how we might be able to achieve that. Finally, we are dealing with a generation that is more comfortable online than anywhere else. In theory, the internet gives everyone a voice, but it also gives everyone a choice about what information to consume and when to consume it. A choice about when to engage in dialogue and when to back out entirely or cloak yourself in the anonymity of apps like Yik Yak. So many of my friends never put their neck out on the line to voice opinions in class or at the lunch table, but are more than willing to start debates online. I think some students aren't willing to stand up for academic freedom because they don't even know, really, what academic freedom is. This, I think, is something that professors, secondary school teachers, and even parents can all help fix. It starts at home, around the dinner table, when families engage in open conversation and parents don't allow their, ch their children to disappear to the TV room or to their cell phones. Then teachers must cultivate classroom environments in which all students are encouraged to voice opinions. They should not let the so-called quiet learners get away with never having their ideas challenged. Quiet learners have ideas too. As I said, I've seen that they are mysteriously not so quiet on the internet. Perhaps our model through all of this should be one of my favorite ancient philosophers, one who, I would remind Marx, did not merely interpret but did change the world, Diogenes the Cynic. His predecessor, Socrates, had been sentenced to death for speaking his mind, and the state of free speech in Athens seemed dire. Enter Diogenes, who did not let the citizens of Athens shy away from open conversation. He accosted them on the streets, posing questions and challenging their opinions. He reminded the Athenians, from the lowliest prostitutes to Alexander the Great himself, what it meant to possess free speech, and he taught them, by example, that free speech is, quote, the most beautiful thing in the world. 2,416 years after the death of Socrates, we are once more forgetting how beautiful and crucial free speech is. Thank you to all of you, and we've, we've ended um, our uh, presentations here on a rather a high note, um, which is one that I'd like to, um, to build upon. Uh, ACTA sends a scolding letter to put it mildly, about every other week to a board of trustees uh, pointing out to them that they are abandoning their fiduciary duty when they do not protect academic freedom and freedom of expression. But of course, um, scolding is um, only one tool to create a cultural change. So the question I want to throw out to all of our um, participants, and then we'll throw it open to the audience, is We've seen a couple of bad years, as um, Professor Harriet in particular pointed out, awful things on campus, disinvitations, um, microaggression hunting, prosecutions. Yet on the other hand, we also saw first the release of the Chicago Principles of Freedom of Expression, and now the wonderful letter from the uh, freshman dean saying that we don't allow a campus where there are safe spaces, where people are silenced. So my, my question is, where are we trending? And in particular, what can we do to build on the positive tr trends? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll offer a first thought, uh, which is, I think, I think something that uh, we didn't quite talk enough about, although there were hints in some of the talks, is that this doesn't start in college, that this starts much earlier. Um, childhood, child rearing and childhood in America changed radically in the 80s and 90s. There was a real crime wave, but the rate of abductions of children was always microscopic. Yet, uh, because of fears f uh, fostered by cable TV, Americans pulled their kids in in the 80s and 90s. Um, we used to have free range childhoods. We used to be able to walk around. My kids, my son is 10 years old, he's afraid to go outside because there are no other kids and, and people look at him funny if they see him on the street. Um, so by the time students, and they've had mandatory anti-bullying training, I mean, by the time they get to college, they are already so conditioned that there's threats, the world is dangerous, and the key thing is moral dependency. If there's a challenge, if somebody says something I don't like, I'm not gonna settle it myself, I go to the adult. 
they learn to go to the adult. So moral dependency is bred in long before they get to college. Now college does all sorts of things. College, and I agree, the, uh, the Women's Studies Department in particular has come up with a set of ideas about intersectionality and matrices of oppression that have filtered down to high schools, but this problem starts way before college. So the, the trend is really, really bad. Other viewpoint. Well, <clears throat> I'm not a uh, sociologist, and I would love to be able to answer the question that was raised as what to do. Um, all I can say is that it seems to me that there are two um, ways of dealing with this. One is individual. I think uh, one underestimates the degree to which a person makes a difference every time you speak up at a meeting or don't. Um, whether you're a trustee, whether you're doing it in an alumni association, certainly if you're a teacher, or but just in private conversation. Never to be quiet if you do not agree with what is being said, especially within a university environment. And sometimes to even force yourself to disagree. That's on the individual level. On the other side, I would say that to, to really deal with systemic problems, the only way to get it done is, I think, for there to be a consortium of universities that tackles a problem together. I think for one group of trustees within a university to do it individually, for example, to try to correct the imbalance that you were talking about, that would be difficult. But if you got seven universities, universities within an area, or universities- Or maybe all those who signed the Chicago Principles could work together. Exactly, so th that's right. And, and there are many things to be fixed, but I think that to do an analysis and to do a critique and to, do, and to try to repair things collectively seems to me to be a way of taking the responsibility away from the individual and making it more e easier to do it. Well, I, I hope when we meet again next year that that list of 20 schools that have signed on will have grown much uh, to a much larger number. Uh, and uh, as we speak, uh, 22,000 trustees, we hope, are uh, considering that letter, telling them to get moving and honor their duty. But other thoughts? Solvik. So uh, my concern is that even the schools that do adopt these principles um, are still having change, and it's change that's coming from the bottom up. So one of my very favorite professors, I love him dearly, um, still instituted trigger warnings in one of his large lectures. And I was horrified to hear that. I still haven't confronted him on the issue. Um, but you, know, you, you can have these schools where uh, we, the administration accepts these principles and the administration puts forward a face to the public of protecting these principles, um, but it's the individual professors who are making a difference. Um, in terms of a network of schools, um, I would also say it's not just that there should be a network of trustees, I'd like to see a network of students. Um, we have the Princeton Open Campus Coalition and we have, I think, three spin-off organizations. There's uh, Duke, Dartmouth, and Brown. Brown of all places have all started um, open campus coalitions, uh, but it's difficult, and you know these students end up getting to, subjected to a lot of hatred. Um, my fellow friends in the Princeton Open Campus Coalition and I have experienced a whole lot of horrible words thrown in our direction. Um, and so, if you are a professor here, um, if you know students who are like-minded and want to be supporting these things, reach out to them, um, help them through this because. It really, it does make a difference when I have professors come up to me and say, I support what you're doing and you know, I wanna be there to help. Um, one of my advisors ended up coming to one of these dinners with some of the Princeton administrators and it meant a lot to me. Um, and yeah, so if you are a professor, reach out to your students and they wanna do something. A lot of students do wanna do something. Can I go? Okay. Um, Solvik sounds so optimistic when she speaks, and like I feel like Cassandra because I feel like like I, I, I'm I'm pessimistic these days. I got really excited when the University of Chicago dean wrote the letter saying that this is not a safe space kind of place, in part because I went to the University of Chicago, so it just made me feel warm all over. Uh, but like the problem is that I also have like the quintessential Cook County education. My other alma mater is Northwestern University, and on the heels of the University of Chicago saying, we're not a safe space kind of place, uh, the president of Northwestern University did an op-ed that said, well, here at Northwestern, we are a safe space kind of place. So that really made me go, 
I crashed again after that. Um, I try to figure out how we're going to get out of the situation that we're in, because I think it's very difficult. I think with all the legal issues that are involved here, with all the structural issues, it's going to be really, really hard to, to, to win this battle. It's not that like small things don't count. Small things count a lot. If we don't have the small things sh you know, shooting back, you know, if we aren't, aren't objecting uh, when things like this happen, it will get worse. Um, but my hope, and this is going to sound terrible, this is my hope for the world, uh, that the next time we have a, 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 a terrible recession, um, that a lot of trustees are alert at that point um, to adjust university budgets in such a way that they are thinking about the structural problems that we have here. We have so much of this university bureaucracy devoted towards these issues. Um, if we pared it down, that would make a really big difference. I just want to add on to what Gail just said. Uh, while I share her general pessimism about trends, I think the answer or, or one area of hope is contained in something she said about how they all march in lockstep. Why are, they all, why are all the universities marching in lockstep? And I think the key for us is to get evolution working. What I mean by that is if all the universities are going this way, but most people are horrified by it, there's such a massive market failure that at some point, there's a huge market for any universities that go the other way. And that's why we're trying to engineer a schism. That's why we're trying to encourage and reward the few that will break away. So I think there is hope that the, the worse things get, the more people on the left come up to Solvig and us and whisper their support. The crazier things get, the more room there is that when some, when some universities do break out, they will find a lot of support. But on the issue of, say, racial preferences, what's needed is like a little line in the Higher Education Reauthorization Act that says, Schools should be able to, to choose their own way here within, within yeah. the framework created right. These by are the most anti racist court. institutions in the country, but they're under federal guidance. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, 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 there have been schools, um, one that I'm quite familiar with, that was, had its accreditation threatened uh, on, this, on this account. These are wonderful discussions. Uh, and I, I'd like to invite the audience. We have a somewhat short amount of time, but let's have some audience questions. Dr. Hussein. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Amjad Hussain from University of Toledo. Um, I have a two-part question, if I may ask. Um, uh, first, um, um, uh, Dr. Haidt. Um, call me naive, but I have heard this word conservative and liberal, and I would uh, ask you if you would be so kind to define that for me. I mean, it's all over. And my second question is to um, uh, Gail Harriet. You outlined the problem, but did not offer any solutions. Um, I have been a trustee of the University of Toledo for the past nine years, just got off two months ago. And I also served on the admissions committee of the medical school. And the problem that you said, yes, it is there, and people uh, do everything possible to get people in uh, for diversity purposes. But if we know there's a disparity between our population in this country, how can we remove that disparity unless we make some structural changes in higher education? A very brief answer to, to, a, to a big question is that there's almost always a left-right axis of disagreement in any polity. Uh, it is related in part to psychological differences. Based on your temperament, some people are attracted to whatever the view of the left is, which is more towards change and undoing what was in the past and progressing towards a different future. Um, in the 60s, the new left uh, abandoned the more worker versus a capitalist left. Uh, and it became mostly about race and gender. And that, so it was the new left making the left-right axis be about race and gender brought us to the point where if you are on the right, then you are a racist and sexist. And that's what has made the left, I think, so certain that the right is evil and therefore so uh, enamored of stamping out diversity because diversity is racism. I mean, intellectual diversity, I mean. 
solutions. Gosh, I wish I had them for you. Uh, I've worked on a lot of these solutions and they haven't worked so far. Um, we, you know, we actually have uh, a constitution that, that guarantees equal protection and we actually have the Civil Rights Act of 1964 um, that says you can't discriminate on the basis of race and Title IX that says you can't discriminate on the basis of, of, of sex. And yet it's happening. Uh, and yet it's causing this problem, I believe, on campus of, 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 of you know, having different groups with different academic credentials and leading to, to a, a, a culture on campus that I think is quite poisonous. Um, I attempted to, to, to persuade the Supreme Court that this was a mistake. Uh, didn't work. Uh, I attempted to, to um, persuade Congress that they should amend the uh, Higher Education and Reauthorization Act to at least let schools, you know, make their own decision and not be bullied into to, to admissions decisions um, by, uh, by accrediting agencies didn't work. Uh, they, they weren't willing to take on the issue, they're afraid of it. That's a big one, I wish I could do that, but one way I can do it is I can actually produce more African-American engineers, more African-American scientists, more Afri African-American lawyers, more African-American college professors. If students only went to the school where their academic credentials put them ballpark in the middle of the class, there is plenty of evidence that what is holding back African-American students is exactly race preferences, uh, and yet people don't want to address that. They don't want to believe it. Um, if there's a golden door here, all you gotta do is open the door and walk through it. Uh, I can't make all the problems go away, but I can increase the number of, of, of black professionals by ensuring that people go to the school where their academic credentials put them um, ballpark in the middle or the upper part of the class. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I see a lot of hands, I'm afraid. Um, uh, Eric, would you uh, pass the gentleman a microphone? Daniel Turner with the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, in my work, I frequently work with state legislators who are very passionate about free speech and very interested in knowing what they can do to promote free speech on campuses. What would you tell them? What can legislators do? Um, that's too hard for me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not certain that I have a, a legislative, a state legislative fix. It's not like we don't already have a First Amendment. Um, but, you know, one of the problems that we have um, is a sort of complicated situation where the law as it's interpreted with regard to, to race and sex discrimination causes employers, um, and here colleges and universities are just another employer for this purpose, it causes them to want to make sure that nobody says anything um, that could possibly be interpreted uh, as a hostile environment. This is particularly on the sex discrimination issue. It comes up far more often than it does um, in, in, in the race area. Uh, it's mainly a sex area. but Title VII, as it's currently being interpreted, um, is creating this incentive uh, for this to occur. Um, and you know, people say, oh, these are often private employers. They're not subject to the First Amendment. Well, the problem is the interpretation of Title VII itself um, is creating uh, the pressure to do this. And that arguably does have constitutional implications. But what would the state legislature do on this? I'd have to give that some thought. I'm going to uh, just well, use the um, just, power of the chair for a oh, moment. So, sorry, I'd, I'd just like to say that the most important thing to be uh, insisted upon is that every person who is invited to campus by a legitimate group is guaranteed the right to speak so that people who interrupt a speaker should be immediately thrown out of the university. This is, uh, this is a simple fact. We'll have time for one more question, but um, since this is the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, I just want to raise a trustee issue. In our research about the University of California system, we discovered, this is apropos of what you had, the point you had raised, um, Gail, um, that the Office of Equity and Inclusion has 142 staff members, full and part-time, and has a budget of $18 million. And, 
uh, in, in response to your question, uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, $18 million could provide an enormous number of scholarships for deserving students rather than 142 uh, professionals in this office. And we do call upon boards of trustees to look upon the way they are using scarce resources and to effect noble goals in a meaningful way, not through bureaucracies. Well, I've taken up more time than I should. One more question, then I'm afraid we have to adjourn. Please. Hi. Um, so I had a question about the trigger warnings that you mentioned. Um, so I don't. I guess I don't see how that uh, harms free speech on campus. I guess I would like for you all to explain that more. So I don't really see like if a professor doesn't change his curriculum at all, but just says, "Hey, by the way, we're going to talk about like rape today." Warning. I don't really see how that harms free speech on campus. So trigger warnings don't directly harm free speech. They don't stop anyone from saying anything. But they are a way in which the faculty in these small ways give into the culture of safety. The culture of safety is a new set of ideas that says that young people are so fragile that if they encounter a word, an author, an idea, an illustration of racism, a, a, a mention of a rape in mythology, if a young person encounters such a thing, they might be traumatized. We therefore have to warn them in advance. Every little thing that college professors do to give in to this demand for safety culture makes more fragile, thin-skinned students who are unprepared to encounter ideas that they disagree with. And so they come out of the trigger warning class where they can say whatever they want, and they have the idea that if the Republican group on campus invited uh, uh, Christina Hoff Summers to speak, well, that is so dangerous it's only the right thing for us to do. We've got to rally and shut her down because she's going to traumatize people. So it's the safety culture which is so pernicious and which is so harmful to students. I'm afraid, with great regret, I'm going to have to wrap up the session. Um, it modeled all the robust exchange of ideas that ACTA has prized. Except for dissent. Nobody disagreed with us here. <laughs> well, true. Um, but those were all good ideas and all uh, given in great candor. Thank you all for being part of this. I know we'll see some of you tonight when we present the Merrill Award. Uh, we are just delighted to have all of you as part of the ACTA network, the ACTA family. Thanks so much. Thank you.